Hello and welcome to the 43rd Annual Conference of the Fulbright Association, this year offered virtually. My name is John Bader. I am the Executive Director of the Fulbright Association, and it is my pleasure to welcome Fulbrighters and friends from around the United States and the world to three days of bold and provocative conversations around vital issues and exciting ideas. I will speak more about the conference at the beginning of the opening plenary at noon Eastern. So let me focus a brief introduction on our first session, race, racism, and diversity. These issues, these issues uh, which have defined the American experience since the first slaves arrived in 1619 have been given even more urgency in 2020. The deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor have sparked an extraordinary yet overdue conversation about systemic racism and social justice in the United States. The Fulbright Association is grateful to further this conversation today with this opening session, showcasing the work and thinking of three amazing women of color. I will introduce them all at once and then they will offer their presentations before we open up the discussion to your questions and comments to any or all of them. You're welcome to use the chat function in Zoom, selecting all panelists and all attendees, sharing where you are now and where you did your Fulbright. However, please submit your questions through the Q&A, which the panelists and I will monitor. When typing a question, begin with the name of the panelist, followed by the question. Please keep your questions brief and focused so that we can get to as many as possible before our time expires at 11.30 Eastern. There will then be a 30 minute break before the opening plenary at noon. Allow me to introduce our panelists in order of their presentations. Ashley Brown Greer is a doctoral student at Howard University researching internationalization at historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs. A Fulbright English teaching assistant to Malaysia, Ashley has been a champion for Fulbright as an alumni ambassador and founder of Fulbright HBCU. Her talk focuses on increasing diversity in international exchange. Dr. Andrea Joseph is an assistant professor of social work at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Her research focuses on racially disproportionate school suspensions, research inspired by her Fulbright to the UK at the University of London. Andrea will discuss how race theory and trauma informed care can help us understand and address racialized trauma. Finally, Piria Pangsaragong and John Viana will share their work on promoting racial integration on children's books. Korea is from Thailand, coming to the US as a Fulbright teaching assistant at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the conference sponsors. She and John are award-winning translators, con contributors to Penn's translation magazine and co-founders of Inter-Thai Media LLC, which brings together people across cultures. Thank you all for joining us and leading this important conversation. So let's begin with Andrea, who takes over from here. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Give me one moment. I'm sorry, aren't we starting with Ashley? Yes, we can do that. I was just ready to go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Ashley. You're you're on first. My my apologies. Go ahead. Okay. Ashley, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, John. I will be talking about increasing diversity in international exchange. So this quote really stuck out to me from the book. It says, majority indifference silently nibble away at the promise of true equality. 6.1%. That is the percentage of black students who studied abroad in 2000, academic year 2016-17 and academic year 2017-2018. Point five percent 
is the percentage of students who participated in study abroad that attended historically black colleges and universities. And this information comes from the Open Doors Report by the IIE. Power is the strength required to bring about social, political, and or economic changes. HBCUs were established to educate former slaves and their descendants during a time when Black Americans were barred from attending predominantly white institutions, or PWIs. The HBCU designation was given to these institutions in the Higher Education Act of 1965. Fun fact, Martin Luther King Jr. attended an HBCU, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. As a result of historical discrimination by the federal and state governments, these institutions continue to face challenges. For example, in 2020, HBCUs still receive less funding per student compared to PWIs. I just wanna remind you that these institutions serve the neediest students. So here's just a little information about HBCUs. They are located mostly in the southern region of the United States as that's where slavery took place. They're in flyover states and in rural and urban areas. And they serve a large number of Pell Grant recipients, first generation low income rural students. And we're not monolithic. We serve black, white, Hispanic, Asian and international students. And just for your information, there are three HBCUs that serve predominantly white student bodies and several um, institution HBCUs that are also Hispanic serving institutions, meaning they have a 25% or more student body um, made up of Hispanic students. The outreach and recruitment strategies for most international exchange programs often does not meet the unique needs of HBCU, minority or underrepresented students, often leaving international exchange opportunities out of reach for these students. Black students and people of color were often excluded from opportunities that were only available to our white counterparts. These opportunities and knowledge of these opportunities like generational wealth have been passed down. One quote that really stuck out to me in, in Martin Luther King's book, Why We Can't Wait, Black people were expected to pull themselves up by the bootstraps without consideration that they didn't have any boots. I'm going to say that again. Black people were expected to pull themselves up by the bootstraps without consideration that they didn't have any boots. This is seen in international exchange programs. While these programs are available for students, for all students, many underrepresented students face barriers when applying and participating in these programs. It's easy to say these students aren't applying or there isn't a large pool of underrepresented students applying, but that shouldn't, but the question should be, why are they not applying? How can students apply if they don't have knowledge of these international exchange opportunities or don't know anyone who's participated? When we look at the staff at HBCUs, they may have a hard time encouraging students to participate in international exchange programs as they may not have the network of international exchange alumni to, to direct students to. I've spoken with several study abroad and student scholar staff who want their students to apply and participate in these programs, but don't know how to help them with just the application process, especially when it comes to essays. So we have to be, we have to do more than the minimum. Black Lives Matter has everyone wanting to be an ally. The question is, are you going to continue to stand with us when this movement ends? All a quote from Martin Luther King's book, all too many white Americans are uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to, play, to pay a significant price to eradicate it. Will you continue working to close this significant gap amongst minoritized groups within international exchange programs? 
what can we do? Build relationships with campus organizations and what I call influencers. I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and a, a one group within um, the Black Greek Letter Organizations. And when, when we're looking to target students, if Black students in particular, we can look to those organizations on campus and really reach out to them and ask them, well not ask them, reach out to them on campus um, because we know that these students have a high GPA and they have to have a good GPA to even remain active in the organization. They have community service hours and they're also leaders on campus. Um, and one of the, I have Royal Court here listed and that's more specific to HBCUs. I also was a campus queen. And so what we know about her is, or her court, the kings and queens, they also have high GPAs, are leaders on campus and are influencers. When we're looking, um, also looking to conduct outreach, um, academic departments on campus are a great place to find students. Specifically looking at the Fulbright English Teaching Assistant Program. No, to you don't have to have teaching experience to participate in that program. But if we're looking to increase diversity, if we're going to an HBCU, definitely check out the School of Education because they are being trained to be educators. Don't leave out our graduate students. I actually did my Fulbright as a, um, after I completed my first master's degree. We know that they have a bachelor's degree for Fulbright and Boring. Those are the minimum requirements. They should be academically qualified and they have either research or work experience. Also start out with these students when we meet them at freshman orientation or new student orientation, just so that they know about these programs and can stay on track with what they need to meet those requirements with throughout um, college. Also think outside of the institution itself. COVID has brought us to the age of virtual webinars and presentations and workshops. Reach out to social media influencers. Fulbright has a um, affinity groups, we're not um, directly affiliated with the Fulbright program, but I'm the founder of Fulbright HBCU. And although my target audience is HBCUs, I've had several non HBCU institutions follow this page and ask for support with, with helping to increase diversity within their um, applicants. Be intentional with exchange alumni. If you're presenting at uh, two students at an HBCU, reach out to alum of the institution that may have attended an HBCU. This allows the students to see themselves participating in the program. They can ask questions that are relevant to their background and make better decisions about applying to the program. As a Fulbright alumni ambassador, I've spoken with students throughout the country. And one of the questions that someone always asks is, what is it like being black and living abroad? And that's a question that, you know, if you don't, if you haven't experienced that, that may, you know, you wouldn't be able to answer that question. Tailor presentations to the students that you're speaking with. Examples, HBCUs have a long history with the Fulbright program. The president of FIS served on the board of the program. And during this time in history, you saw HBCU students being awarded and participating in the Fulbright program specifically. And what's even more amazing is they were studying abroad while the US was still pretty much segregated in the South. Also consider hosting exchange events and conferences at HBCUs or MSIs. Volunteer to help support study abroad and student scholar staff with outreach and recruitment, student essays, presentation, service mentors. Connect staff from underrepresented institutions and with institutions who, ha who have had success with students being accepted to these programs. We have to work together to close this gap. I look forward to your questions and your thoughts regarding my presentation. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your discussion this morning and look forward to questions 
pose to uh, Ashley and others later on, please remember to use the Q&A function for putting in those questions. You could put them in at any time. Uh, the, uh, all of us on this panel are watching those and ready to respond when all the presentations are done. Our next uh, guest is Andrea. So go ahead, Andrea. Okay, um, good morning. Well, if you're in Central Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time, good morning. If you're in other parts of the country, good night. Nice to meet everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Give me one second here. Uh, here we go. Oh boy. I am having a little difficulty sharing my screen for some reason. Ashley, just, uh, just make sure that you're on the Zoom screen the Zoom, the actual Zoom program, and there should be a share screen green button at the very bottom. Right. Um, do we mind if the next speaker is ready to go ahead? I'm just not seeing where to share my screen for a moment. <laughs> sure. Can do. Is that okay, Peria and David? Are you ready to go? No and worries. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, John. Uh, so, John and Pierre, you're you're on. We we welcome you and uh, appreciate your flexibility. Uh, we'll we'll figure okay. out. It. No problem. All right, on you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so here we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about racial integration in children's books and how that might work. So, oh. who are we? Okay, so my name is Piria Pongsarigan, and I was an FLTA teaching Thai at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'm glad that I'm still continuing Fulbright's mission of like promoting um, diversity and bringing understanding, you know, between like the US and other countries. And so I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer here in Thailand, also author, educator, and translator. And we are now co-founders of Inner Thai Media based on our experiences that we've been about to share with you. So how did we get started? Okay, so we got started because I heard about Open IDEO Challenge and like it was a competition and we wanted to submit manuscripts for a children's book that engages children and provides adults with ways to support early language development as well as um, um, encouraging relationship and like communication between caretakers and children. And of course the setting should be Philadelphia or like other big cities. And I started to think about that when I was studying children literature at the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought about, oh, okay. So what are children of Philadelphia like? So just Google children in Philly and you see diversity. Like there's a like communities of African American families, like Asian families and like, you know, like white people. So like there's a lot of diversity in Philadelphia. But also we know that Philadelphia is also an inherently unequal city in many ways and socioeconomic ways and how that breaks down along color and class lines. And so the question then becomes, how do we portray that? Or do we have to be faithful to portray that um, in our book and in the art in our book? And what we came to understand with among each other is that this demographic zero to three is a space where both children and adults are free to play. And this also connects with the work of Dr. Uh, Ebony Thomas at UPenn, who is kind of working on the, the concept of how fantasy can show alternate or counter realities that can be productive in, in this kind of social justice um, and racial justice considerations. And so we decided that we were gonna portray something that might be unique and not yet real, but it would be meaningful nonetheless. So what did we think? We thought initially that the US has a large integrated urban and suburban markets, meaning that we have lots of diversity across the country. 
And that given the current political climate, as Ashley mentioned, we have BLM going on among you know, a lot of people dying and a lot of people protesting uh, police interactions with civilians and stuff. So we have a comparatively, compared to the rest of the world, we have a keen awareness of the need for diversity and a comparative, comparative openness to discuss issues of race and equality through media. As we all know, not every US, US market is ready for that or they're in different stages, right? Um, but however, this is both sides are kind of major selling points because markets that would see the need for the diversity would, would be interested in our, in our project. And then markets that have not yet experienced diversity or are mostly uh, monoethnic or mostly white, let's say, they would, uh, schools and nonprofits are interested to bring an inclusive experience to those people would be interested in having a book that could do so. All right, so let's go back to Thailand. So in Thailand, we kind of have like a specific view on skin color. For example, we tend to think that like whiter is better, like fairer is better in terms of skin color, although it started to change recently. So I feel like, you know, we, we are like monocultural society. So we might not be ready for diversity in children book yet because we tend to value like being similar rather than being like different. Like, so this example is from a TV commercial and it says just being white makes you win. So I feel like if we're gonna publish like a children book which chose diversity. Thai people might not be ready for it yet because they might feel not relatable, you know, because like we're just so mo monolingual. No, sorry. Yeah, I mean, both monolingual <laughs> and monocultural <laughs> as well. Yeah. And so this brought us to our, our first decision point was that we were going to have primarily a US style artwork uh, in terms of the settings for our book. And what kind of book would we show, right? Be well, First, well, let's look at the data. So we can see that 77% of all children's books are either white or animals. And that leaves about the remaining 23% for African-American, Asian Pacific, Latinx, and First Nations people. And what's interesting is that all of these um, are very distinct and stovepipe categories. And that, that's an interesting thing that we'll see um, how we approach that a little bit later on. Uh, all right. And if we take a look at diverse children's books and like you see like this children's book like popped up. For example, these are examples from Julian is a Mermaid, Snow Day and Red Kite, Blue Kite. Mm -hmm. And what we observe is that although they say like it's diverse, but actually the main character is usually portrayed like among the people who are the same, like ethnicity, like for example, an African American children, you know, grows up and lives with African American people. And as well as like Asian kids mm. stay in an Asian family. Yeah, so it's not really diverse in terms of ethnicity and like races and mm. like cultures. Okay, so what's missing? Um, the picture on, I guess, the left, it comes from a documentary done by Bill Moyers in 1976 called The Way It Is. And in this episode took place in Rosedale, Queens, New York, not far from where I was born, um, about five or six years later. And what's interesting is that it was the predominantly multi-ethnic white neighborhood where uh, one Black family moved in, uh, I think from the West Indies, and, and all hell broke loose. And essentially what had happened is that all the white people decided that they had no model for how to integrate with black people at that time. And so that distress for lacking that model for a common integrated community is part of the reason why the neighborhood banded together, firebombed uh, their new neighbor's house twice, once with them in it, and had numerous protests invoking even the name of the KKK. And it's all stemming from the fact that they had no concept of what living together truly means. And so this is, I think, where we start to get some inspiration for how we're going to address the art in our book and what it needs to look like. All right, so this is what's missing. Hmm. Um, we have research on like um, multicultural and multiracial children's books. And what we found is like multiracial children's books are not really like multiracial, as I said before. And this is what we found is a children's book back in like 1973. It's called Black is Brown is Tan. 
But anyway, this book addresses like this issue like intentionally. So we have a feeling that it might be like too didactic, mm -hmm. too like preaching, you know, <laughs> just like teaching and preaching, like telling you know, children, what it is and like what should be done and what they should behave. So it's not fun. And we want to make our book fun. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after thinking so hard, we decided that our book has to be universal in nature. So it's not, we're not appropriating any particular culture, but trying to appeal to common everyday experiences. And we want to have it take place in an open setting. So the setting doesn't need to be or shouldn't be evocative of any particular place, but it should be um, done in a way that um, as many people as possible can identify with, with the setting. And that moves us to the characters, that our characters should be in all shades, all styles, and ideally all abilities. And we almost made it there, but not quite. Next, in our next book, we will. Um, so that we can show kids and parents a wide a gamut as, as we can to expose them and to, to start to give them uh, a model of what living together as one people might look like. Also, the story needs to be told in a relatable way for both kids and adults so that primarily the book will be story driven. And through the art, the experience of the art will give the broader picture of society that we're trying to portray. And that way, both kids and adults will see a clear value for the book and will be willing to engage with it. And that also creates uh, opportunity for interaction between caregivers and the children who are reading together. All right. so. What happened was we didn't win, <laughs> but <laughs> we got positive feedback from other participants. And because it happened during my Fulbright term, so I got to read two children, you know, two groups of children at a kindergarten and uh, at the free, lib uh, free library of Philadelphia. And, you know, like I got positive feedback. I mean, I, I would imagine like, you know, 30, you know, children shouted and just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so at that time, there were no pictures. I just read and I didn't even make my noise. So like, okay, this is like father speaking. Mm. So I just like read it. Like, you know, <laughs> I was so boring, but like <laughs> the, ch the children got so excited and they responded. So like, it was very sincere. And I felt like, well, okay you know, I shouldn't like ignore it, you know, after my Fulbright ended. Okay. okay. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, because of, of the great feedback and the experience of writing the book, we decided to start a company and take it forward ourselves. And so here's a, a little bit of the reason you can see in the art on top is what we submitted to Open IDEO. It's still living on the web. So you can go see our full proposal and the full rationale. But uh, after hiring artists, it looks a whole lot better. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Actually, I drew that. You know, it's just like, it's, it's forever, you know, on the website. Yeah. And so in the yeah. picture below, the little girl is our protagonist who also has no name uh, so that the reader can feel that can become the protagonist as well. And she, in that moment, she's talking to uh, grandma and grandpa. And then here is a great shot that shows kind of the diversity that we're going for um, in the book. And so that we try to, to show people of all shades, of all lifestyles as best we can. And whilst, while it being uh, smoothly integrated with the content. We have a cat over there. <laughs> <laughs> the cat is a whole subplot actually that our artists just threw in. And it really gives the book immense value. Okay. <laughs> so I think Safe talked about this one already. You want to explain the scene? Okay. So, all right. It's just like what happened before. It just like the family asked this girl if, you, if she wanted to carry her little brother, Joshua. <laughs> and like before I even finished my sentence, you know, when I read to the kids, mm -hmm. it's just like, no, no, <laughs> no, no way with like all emotions, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, were we right in thinking that the U.S. would be our primary market, and that having, and that having mostly U.S. related places and, and character identities, be a good idea? Well, not so much. What shattered our expectations was that our artists started teasing out the art that they were working on for the book, uh, on their Facebook pages, and our artists actually come from Thailand. 
And so ties were starting to ask, like, when's the book coming out? When's the book coming out? And so we kind of had to make a rush decision to make it bilingual. And we also decided that we would start to um, publish it in Thailand first, and then we would try to bring it over to the US a little bit later. And interest around the world though has been very good so far. All right, so what I learned from making this book actually, <laughs> oh, okay. So it's like developing countries like Thailand, we are more ready for integration of races in children's books because everybody just like, you know, fell in love with it. And like, there have been no complaints on like, mm. you know, the girl being black. It's just like, you know, everybody just loves her and it's like, okay, I want to pick you up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> anyway, and because um, in the story, we deal with like, you know, sibling bribery. So I feel like it's relatable and it's universal. So universal message is key to create strong bonds with the readers, like no matter what nationality or races. Mm. And that also helps to humanize the character's experience and to give an authentic experience of diversity. And so also access to diverse books is only part of the challenge, right? We need books that show a wide variety of different kinds of people it's speaking different languages as well, um, who have different, differently abled and how society can integrate them to create one story. And then kids and parents can use that as a model for how they approach their world. And of course, and that creates the, the, humanizing, fa the humanizing factor and makes others less so and less scary to approach and creates what more openness um, to those people or to others, for lack of a better word. All right, and like teachers should be well trained to use like this kind of book because like we don't want to emphasize on like being different or like you know mislead children like being different is like it's too outstanding or like it's too embarrassing, mm -hmm. and like it's okay to be the same. It is okay to be different as well. So you know, in in our book, like this one, we. I mean, like, we didn't really address, like, you know, racism, like, directly, but, like, when children read it, like, it's probably one of the first things they notice that, oh, okay, that family, you know, has a lot of, like, Chinese, like, grandpa, grandma, <laughs> and, like, they say that, okay, we have, like, you know, Einstein, <laughs> grandpa, <laughs> and, like, Chinese grandma, yeah, mm -hmm. And this, so here's our goal personally mm -hmm. and, and for our business is to create a space for what's missing, to create a, a whole book category that can be multi-ability, multi multi-ethnic and multi-racial and also as in the case of this book, uh, multilingual, right? Because we have both English and Thai side by side on the page. And we hope to continue that and to create that into a category that can then be counted and we, and eventually added to graphics like this yeah you can see that like multiracial children are queuing up to like you know <laughs> make up like starting with small percentage and like growing and growing so that's our goal thank you thank you wonderful thank you thank you so much piria and john uh, for a very provocative conversation on children's books and the imagery that are so important in communicating our values and our aspirations to uh, young people across the planet. So thank you so much. We look forward to uh, questions posed to Piria and John on the Q&A. Please uh, remember that we're not monitoring the chat room for questions, but uh, instead please post them to Q&A. Thank you so much. Okay, Andrea, um, how are you doing? Uh, are, we, are we in good shape? Yes, there we go. Fantastic. Um, so uh, please, Andrea Joseph uh, on her, uh, uh, her presentation. Thank you so much, Andrea. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your time and work with, with me through the, the technical glitch. Um, so let's see, um, I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee uh, College of Social Work, and I'll be talking to you a bit about my work and the way that I look at critical race theory and trauma-informed care as it relates to youth um, being suspended at school. Um, I'm not control.
So whoever's controlling it, can you proceed? Thank you. So um, we often think of MLK's um, um, often um, mentioned quotes, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but for the content of their character. This quote is used again and again, and so often. Um, what I would suggest is Dr. King wasn't asking us to be colorblind. As much as he didn't want his children to be judged for their color of the skin, I don't think that Dr. King was asking us to not think about race at all and the way that it forms our own identities and it's valuable to our young people. You can proceed. So my colleagues and I and two of my doctoral students came up with this model. There are so many things happening in schools in terms of a variety of interventions and the newest model. And I say it's important for us to keep race at the center and as we think about addressing disproportionality in school suspension. So we will revisit this image. Proceed, please. So nationally, here's what we know um, from our 2015-2016 data. Um, newer data just got released, and so I'll have to update this soon. Um, but we know um, our last collection of data shows that 2.8 or K through 12 students receive 2.8 million one or more out of school suspensions across the United States. Um, compared to their white peers, black K through 12 students are 3.8 times more likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions. This is the conversation of disproportionality, right? And we see this disproportionality also across income among students with special educational needs as well. We also know that black girls account for 8% of enrollment, but are 13% of students receiving one or more out of school suspensions compared to white girls. You can proceed, please. Why do we care? Here are the reasons. We know that kids being suspended leads to poor academic outcomes, so poor social outcomes and behavioral issues. We've heard of the concept, the, the school to prison pipeline, that children who are suspended are more likely to be incarcerated later in their life, more likely to drop out of high school or in school um, and be socially dis um, engage, disengaged. Please proceed. So I also introduced this concept of ACEs. Many of you may have heard this acronym. It stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, the, this is done by a, um, a well-known study by Filetti and colleagues, 1998, which says that the extent to which youth experience some of these 10 um, ACEs, they, they include psychological, physical, sexual abuse, witnessing violence, against one's mother, et cetera, as you can see, um, there's later negative health outcomes, right? Even early death, it's linked to. The Philadelphia study diversified the sample and found that um, in Philadelphia that witnessing or hearing violence, experience, experiences with discrimination, adverse neighborhood experiences, childhood bullying, and experiences in foster care also significantly um, predict or um, relate to um, behavioral problems in children, um, health problems as an adult, um, um, substance abuse, and even early death. Please proceed. So again, why do we care about this? How does this impact young people? We know that this can have a, a specific impact on their own brain development. And if not caught early, it can be permanent, right? And so, um, this type of toxic stress um, from the adversities experienced in childhood can lower tolerance of stress, which can result in behaviors such as fighting, checking out, or defiance, increases problems with learning and memory, may cause health problems, as I've mentioned, increases stress hormones, which affects the body's ability to fight infection, increases difficulty in making friends and making relationships, and it reduces the ability to respond um, to, to or learn and figure things out. All of these are crucial for our children's well-being in school. Please proceed. So I also use this image from Child Trends to think about the extent to which children across the United States have two or more ACEs, right? Again, that previous slide that looked at the variety of um, um, negative um, childhood adversities. And we can see across the United States um, in terms of these various regions where children have two or more ACEs. But as you can see highlighted in the yellow boxes, we see where there's a disproportionate, um, there's this uh, uh, statistically significant difference in the number of ACEs across race. And we see time and time again in these boxes that students of color generally have higher ACEs than some of their white counterparts. Please proceed. 
We also see that across the United States, um, that paddling is still um, used primarily in the South here, where you see orange and red across these states, that paddling is still used as a means um, to discipline children. One thing I've known thus far is that when children are suspended, it doesn't always have the positive effect that we're hoping that it would have, right? That they would go to home and thinking about the error of their ways. And in that same way, we see where paddling is um, primarily um, within a particular region of the United States. Um, what happens when we're paddling children who are experiencing abuse at home, who are experiencing violence in their community, that the school itself becomes a violent place um, for children who are also experiencing violence, which we know is racially disproportionate. Please proceed. Um, Dr. Delahook um, challenges us to think about students' behaviors as top-down or bottom-up behaviors, meaning behaviors that are controllable and intentional or planned versus behaviors that are reflexes, a reflexive, atomic, uh, automatic or, st or stress response, meaning we have to consider the extent to way which children are being disciplined in school um, for behaviors that may be related to their adversities and not simply thinking that a suspension or a paddling will, sus will solve the behavior. Please proceed. And so this is important to consider because there are now um, lawsuits being put forward. This is uh, an excerpt from a class action lawsuit, um, Peter P. at all versus Compton Unified School District, in which the subject was that children needed academic accommodation because of their ACEs. And as you see highlighted in black, um, that the children are subjected to trauma impacted to and um, impacted students punitive and counterproductive suspensions, expulsions, and expulsions involuntary transfers, in referrals to law enforcement, which pushed them out of school. So there's even legal precedence for our need to focus on young people's ACEs in the way that it's disproportionate. Please proceed. So what can we do? Please proceed. It's important for us to consider trauma-informed care in schools. And trauma-informed um, um, schools is one in which all school I focus on all school administrators, teachers, staff, students, families, and community members recognize and respond to the behavior, emotional, relational, and academic um, impact of uh, traumatic stress. Um, really exciting work is taking place in Tennessee, and that is recent legislation was passed where all educators, all school-based staff must be trained in trauma-informed care, and a child's ACEs levels must be considered before suspending them, right? Because we know it's counterproductive. Please proceed. We know these from SAMHSA to be components of trauma-informed care, which is in creating a, a safe environment. Because if we know these children have experienced high levels of stress, toxic stress specifically, we need to ensure that they're feeling safe mentally, right? Um, that they're saving, feeling safe in their body, socially. Um, that we're supporting and teaching emotional regulation. That if the child has been exposed to toxic stressors, um, that there needs to be an opportunity within our schools or community um, communities to demonstrate ways that young people can regulate their emotions as they're dealing with what's going on inside. And we also see the need to build relationships. That is the key here. It's about knowing that the child has some place, someone safe to communicate with, that, that it's a consistent adult, a safe adult and an understanding adult, and not one that simply wants to spank them or suspend them for um, not able, not being able to regulate their emotions. Please proceed. So there are a variety of interventions across um, schools these days, and this is not just in, in the United States. Um, I'll specifically be speaking about restorative practices, which is the work that I do, um, looking at the way that using restorative practice conversation circles are a means to develop relationships. So you can look at this slide and take note of these as interventions to address disproportionate school suspensions or um, broken relationships between adults and students. Please proceed. So here's a bit of what that model looks like. Specifically, this is a model from the International Institute for Restorative Practices, where we say, see there's a spectrum of types of restorative practices that can be used. Um, I'll talk to you specifically about the group or circle, where we sit students down to have conversations about simple topics such as what flavor ice cream is your favorite to who's your hero, to tell us something about your identity that you would like us to know. This is all about relationship building so you can understand the context of a child's behavior. Please proceed. Really, using restorative practices is about a paradigm shift 
from going from punitive discipline to being restorative about our practices, to thinking about the whole child, to thinking about their mind, body, and spirit um, as, as, as it shows up in the school. Please proceed. Again, um, you, if you know a bit about restorative practices, it is tiered, meaning we can have the community building um, components of it, or when it comes to real extreme behaviors or extreme circumstances, extreme ACEs, this is where a school social worker or psychologist comes into play to make sure that there's one-on-one -on -one ability to develop relationship, create safety, um, and create connection. Please proceed. These are types of circles um, and the purpose behind the circles. And much of my research is focused on the community building circles. And I propose to you, we can use these community building circles as, a, as an opportunity to also talk about children's identity. Next. So here are some questions um, that I've collected from circles that I've seen and some that I've created myself. When you're having these circle conversations with students, there are norms built. And I must say, it is important to have training in restorative practices before you try this sort of thing. Um, you can even Google restored practice circles um, on YouTube and you, you might see a demonstration of what this looks like. But as we can see, we can have introductory circles. Before you can get to the hard conversations, you need to be able to de develop relationship. So asking a question like, describe one good thing about yourself. Um, if you could be a sports hero, who would you be and why? This is just a way to get the students to begin to trust each other, trust you as the adult and create help, help, healthy atmosphere. You can also ask socio-emotional questions. What do you do when you're trying to control your anger? What do you, other kids do um, that get on your nerves? Or once you've built community and you've established rapport, you can begin to ask a question such as, describe one thing that makes you proud about your cultural background. Describe a time um, that you did not or you did feel treated equally at your school. This is important um, to center children's voices and center their experiences and create relationship so that they know that they count. And so also when they feel treated unfairly in school, that they know that there's an environment established where their voice matters. Please proceed. So I'm just showing an image here. For those of you interested in doing this, you can create a simple um, Excel spreadsheet and come up with your own questions. But some of the best questions that I've seen were, were developed by students. So feel free, this doesn't take 100% um, expertise to do it. It takes interest and investment in young people. Please proceed. As I mentioned, we, we would revisit this image. Um, when we're thinking about restorative practice conversations and circles, um, we need to center race. When we think about the racially disproportionate school suspensions across the country, oftentimes I found that interventions sometimes are introduced in our schools in a race neutral format. Again, thinking back to Dr. King's quote, while he doesn't want his children to be um, to judge by the, the color of their skin, I also say that we, I don't think the charge is to be race neutral, to act as if we don't see it. Because the fact is, it's okay for us to acknowledge the differences between ourselves, the beauty of our racial makeup and our culture. And part of what I do is use critical race theory, as you can see these tenets, um, the centrality of race and racism, right? That race exists. We know at least in the United States, it's a construct that we have to acknowledge exists because we make decisions based on it every day. But it's also good to acknowledge, again, the beauty of our differences. We know that racism exists. Um, and if we, if we ignore it and say, don't just speak about it, we allow it to proliferate. Um, it's important to recognize that every institution and every culture, every family has a dominant perspective and that a school itself has a dominant perspective. Um, and so I'll forward um, to the next slide. Um, if you can proceed again. Um, and click two more times actually. One more time again and again. I wanna bring us to this slide here where I situate um, CRT and trauma-informed care. And again, when we're challenging the dominant perspective, I explain what this means in ABC here, but in one, two, three, if you look at three, please proceed. It says, is there an expectation for students of color to exhibit resilience and grit in the face of trauma compared to their white peers? Do we expect resilience yet ignore intervention? Do we reward trauma-related resilience and punish maladaptive trauma coping? These are questions that I offer to educators to think about the way to center race, 
and to center students' trauma and to center children's experience to ensure that it counts and that we're not disciplining them for things that, uh, for adversities they, they've experienced. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. A, a fascinating uh, a research agenda and a powerful message about resilience and and the, the way that community can come together to help uh, young people of color to embrace their identity, not run from it, to be to love who they are. That's such an incredibly important uh, part of any child's experience, and I'm so glad to have your your comments on this. We have uh, a lot of really great great questions out there. We're uh, we're grateful to all of you who are doing that. Please put more in. Now that Andrea is done, you're you're welcome to put uh, more questions for her. But let's start with some questions that um, uh, have been posed already. Uh, a couple of uh, Fulbrighters online have asked uh, this question to Ashley, but I'm sure Andrea could answer it as well. Which is basically what is it like being black and living abroad? Uh, it is inarguable that it's important that the Fulbright uh, more fully represent all of who we are, but there are clearly challenges when you go overseas. Um, what what are those some of those experiences like? If you could share that, Ashley, and then Andrea. Um, so I think westernized media plays a big role in how people perceive Black Americans. And actually, I was in Malaysia. And so in my small community, I always got the question, like, you're not American. You, you're from Africa. And I'm like, no, I've never lived in Africa. I never, my parents, my grandparents. And oh, oh. And so I was very intentional in my classroom with my students to teach them the history of um, slavery and civil rights. And it really helped my students really bond with me. Um, but also my experience as a black person living abroad, it really, for me, it, I was already pro-black, <laughs> but it just really made me love myself even more and my race even more. Um, however, with that, I did experience challenges, um, of course, having natural hair, being pointed at, being laughed at, um, just walking down the street, um, cameras in my face. I was never pretty. I think uh, Paria mentioned in, um, you know, the love of being white. And so I was never pretty. I could sing. I was a great singer. But my white counterparts, they were always pretty, always. And so um, just navigating that. Um, and then I was lucky that my school and my co-teachers really embraced me. One of my co-teachers actually studied abroad in the UK. But some of my other cohort members who were Black, um, one was often called a Negro, um, over-sexualized for the Black males. Um, my one of my friends, Nicole, she actually wasn't able to conduct any of her projects because just the her the color of her skin. So, Andrea, do you want to comment on this? You know, I talk about this in funny mm -hmm. enough. Less than twenty four hours ago, last student here in the United States. And she is a black woman um, of lighter complexion than myself from Jamaica. And, um, and I studied in, in the United Kingdom. And while um, what I found is that I'm of, um, though I was born in the U United States, my parents are from the Caribbean. And I found that I had a new racial script about myself when I went to the United Kingdom. There were, for example, when you have to go to the doctors, you might, in the United States, you would click maybe your racial background and I would put black or African American. But in the United Kingdom, I click black um, or click Afro Caribbean, right? And so there's a different designation. All of a sudden, um, there was a different script for what it meant to be Afro Caribbean in the United Kingdom that I came to learn for myself that was different in the United States. And I found that. Um, um, there was a different type of resilience that Afro-Caribbeans felt the need to exhibit in the United Kingdom, Kingdom because of negative racial stereotyping against Afro-Caribbeans. Now, I don't feel that I felt that negativity because 
I was in a very privileged space, I felt, as a Fulbright scholar um, that afforded me access to unique experiences. But the very work I did was on Afro-Caribbean students. And I said to myself, it was, if I was born in the United Kingdom, while I would still have the same hue about myself, that my racial narrative, uh, narrative about myself impressed on me in society would be quite different. I'd like to shift. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I'd like to shift to uh, Piria and John. Um, one question is uh, a, a related to a comment that you made that Thailand is not ready. Uh, the question is generally, what steps would you take to make a society ready? Uh, I realize that's a big question, but thinking that we're not ready to handle diversity seems like an excuse to just keep pushing off challenges to respect each other, to love each other way into the future and never get to it. When is enough and how do you get ready? Thank you. Well, the short answer is that that assumption was not right, actually. Um, the, the reaction that we got from the artwork was that our, our understanding of broader Thai culture was, was wrong in that regard. And, and I think that's a good thing. I'm quite happy to be wrong about that. Um, more, more to the point, there's another question that also asks um, something similar about, uh, about this topic, about whether it's easier to see a foreign version of inclusion and integration than to do the internal reflection to see what the Thai version would look like. And I think that at the moment is entirely the case, that by having a foreign version of, of what racial inclusion looks like, that will give ties a model with which how they can reflect on their own society and then they can create what they would view as inclusion from their own internal perspective and that's how that's i think ultimately the way forward okay so let me elaborate on that a little bit because like in thailand we also have like pro problems about the three southern provinces so i feel like we're facing the same problem and uh, like trying to create like media that would fit like, you know, all nationality and races. So yeah, and so my opinion is just like, you just put it out there, like don't think too much <laughs> and let them deal with it. I mean, like it's so spontaneous, but it worked, you know? So you just like start doing it and just like that, let the society decide and mm. like take it in little by little, yeah. Ashley, a, a, a question to you now. Um, what could be done to increase the number of scholarships available to enable minority students to study abroad? There are lots of barriers uh, between uh, a vision of full inclusion in the Fulbright. Um, let's talk about some of the other pieces. Maybe there's funding, um, other, other things that, um, that, might, uh, that might help us get there. Okay. So I actually read that question and I had to write some notes down. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, Just I like a full writer to be fully prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, I honestly think we have enough, right? Yes, there can be more. I'm all on board about creating more and targeting specific students and institution types, but that may cause, you know, that may cause some, some pushback amongst people. But I think we have enough awards. I think the issue is we don't have the supports in place to help those students really know about the Fulbright program. I, I for one, didn't know about the Fulbright program. I literally was on Morgan State University's website and was like, oh, I wanna teach abroad, Googled it. And that's how I came across Fulbright. When I got it, I told my family and they're like, oh, that's great. <laughs> 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 and my aunt works at Huntington University, which is a predominantly white private college in Montgomery, Alabama. And so she was telling her colleagues about it and they were all up in arms like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, blah, 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 blah. So, and she was like, okay, let me stop and Google it. Let me learn more. So it goes back to that. If I don't know about it, I can't apply for it. You can give, you can put all the money out there in the world towards it, but if you don't know about it, it's a waste, right? But there are some things that should be put in place for these minority students. One of the things that really, for me, I didn't, A, I didn't know what the heck to pack. I was going to Malaysia. I was like, what do I pack? I didn't understand why I needed multiple passport photos. <laughs> like wow. something as simple as that, right? 
I had a pet. Luckily for me, I already had a passport, but the price of passports um, for me going over there, I had no clue about, yes, I did a project, but I didn't know, oh, I could have raised money prior to going. But coming back for me was also just as difficult, right? I didn't have a job. I was a Fulbrighter. I saw my peers who did not look like me getting jobs all over the place. And I just so happened to get a job from ND teaching at a charter school, which <laughs> wasn't my best experience. And I left the K-12 classroom altogether after that. But there needs to be supports when we return home as well, because as we know, Black people across the board, we're, Financial wise, we struggle. I'm, I'm a struggling PhD student right now. <laughs> um, but there, there just needs to be more support all around. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll crowdsource support for uh, struggling graduate students uh, and we'll take- Please do. <laughs> <laughs> a good question here for Andrea. Andrea, uh, um, uh, someone thanks you for your excellent moving presentation. Uh, she asks, how can we help adults in a child's community, administrators, teachers, parents, guardians, to shift their view of children, childhood development, and how to help children become their fullest best selves? We adults need training and reinforcement of our more humane ideas. Can government public service announcement help? Can houses of worship help? How can we create a movement to shift mindsets among adults? Yes. Thank you for asking. I think um, part of the answer was in the question that the person proposed. It's, it's definitely training, not only, right? It's training and practice. It's diversified training. So it's training on child development. I like to say that we shouldn't consider that children are just mini adults. They are growing into their self. They are working on self-actualization, which is a thing that adults themselves are still working on. They are experiencing new emotions daily. Um, so children are not many adults, they are young people. Um, and so it takes time for the adults to sit back and go back to the child development training. Just because you were a child doesn't know, doesn't mean that you know sort of the science behind child development, right? So getting those child development trainings, there's so much online these days, you know, see what you can find. Um, Understanding um, trauma-informed care. So many states are moving towards and organizations are providing trauma-informed care training to understand the relationship now between the child's development and the impact of trauma on their brain and their bodies. Um, and finally, you know, again, when we think about our, our students of color, our children of color, to consider if you don't come from the same racial background as that child, there's probably a lot, there's gonna be a gap and that's okay. You can fill that gap in by reading training and asking questions right but asking questions doesn't mean being uh, mean um, being asking rude questions it means developing a relationship to get to know people and then they share their story with you and this is why i really focus in on the unit of uh, like using restorative practices as a means to share those stories so that you don't have to ask now do you wash your hair once a week or once a month i think that's really weird right that's an inappropriate way to ask a question um an appropriate thing to do is to develop a relationship spend time right get to know that person so that you're not afraid to ask embarrassing questions thank you so much uh Peria and john uh um let's see we've got a question here is the usa reluctant to embrace children's books on racial diversity only or all diversity. Why do you think there is a reluctance in the USA and how do you propose we begin to take down walls of reluctance and resistance? Oh, that's a good one. So <laughs> I've, I would say that right now, I think the walls are coming down. I would say that there isn't necessarily a reluctance to have diversity in children's books, but I would say that there is a feeling of a lot of that many the many books that if we go back to our slide that showed all the different types of books out there characters that if I need if I'm going to write a Latino character I need to be Latino or I need to have some significant experience with the Latino community or if I'm going to write a black character I need that that same kind of integration with the community to have that experience and that's why we developed the formula of having a very general bland story 
that is universal. It doesn't come out of any particular community's experience, but comes straight out of human experience. And so we bypass a lot of the cultural appropriation stuff, a lot of the, well, no, you've got that wrong bit, because we're not telling stories from the individual perspective. All we do is we use the art to show what social integration looks like visually. So we have, so any character can speak with any kind of voice, as long as we're showing that they're getting along, that they're creating a society that works for them. And then they're both the readers, the young readers and the old readers, the parents, they can see how that works and then they can begin to apply that in their own lives straight away. And that's, that's sort of our hope and our goal. Right. Maria, do you wanna to add to that or you're good? Okay. Good. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. All right, back to uh, Ashley. Um, one, your, your study of HBCUs and institutions and their involvement in internationalization is really important. So many of the folks on this, uh, this Zoom uh, webinar today represent institutions of higher learning around, around the country. If you could give them some advice beyond what you've already shared, and not only about um, increasing diversity among study abroad, but generally being more attuned to diversity questions in the international space. Uh, what advice would you give them? You've got a platform, go. Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I was trying to write it down. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm talking, I'm, it's, I'm blabbering here. Um, what I'm suggesting is that institutions around the country uh, would appreciate your advice on how to be more supportive of students of color regarding the, the international, but generally speaking, how can institutions do a better job with diversity and the international? Um, I think with institutions, um, advice on how to be more supportive. Um, I think I mentioned within the presentation, making sure we catch these students from when they first enter college, right? Um, and I think someone else in the chat mentioned, how do we start before then in that K through 12 space? Well, we know Fulbright has the, I think it's not the global classroom, reach the world. And so if we're targeting those students, I believe <laughs> from K through 12 and, and definitely in that high school level to let them know this is something that can be done. I think that will absolutely change the minds and they will have that international mindset, right? I'm one who barely got out of high school. If you'd asked my teachers, would I even be a Fulbrighter? They probably would have said no. My undergraduate institution, Talladega College had bigger fish to fry and international wasn't an important piece. Had someone caught me early at my time at Talladega College, I probably would have taken more um, foreign language classes, I would have been on track to being more prepared for international. So we have to target them. As I mentioned earlier, um, going to those academic classrooms and talking with students. I do it all the time. And you would be amazed at the amount of students who are like, oh, I, I didn't think I was interested, now I'm interested. Um, Fulbright did a partnership with Watch the Yard recently. Um, and they highlighted Fulbrighters. I think it was about five or six of us. I actually had people reach out to me on uh, Instagram. Hey, I'm interested in Fulbright. You know, I didn't think it was obtainable, but oh, I see some, I see you, you did it. I wanna hear about it. Um, from that, one of the young men that I talked with, he recently invited me to come to North Carolina, well not come, do a virtual presentation at North Carolina A&T with his club. And so we have to find though where those students are, that specific group that we're looking for. Two, two points uh, from my vantage point. Uh, one is that the Fulbright Association continues to expand our Fulbright in the Classroom project, which is designed to share the Fulbright experience and our love of the international, uh, especially with underrepresented communities. And uh, uh, we look forward to uh, all of your help and input on, on making that a success. A second point I'd make, Ashley, is the application process is something that needs to really be looked at in a serious way. That um, a, a selection committees can be looking for people who look like themselves, maybe not consciously, but they see themselves in the applicant and they say, wow, that guy or that woman, she, uh, she can do a great job because she's just like me. And that can be a trap. 
Um, a question for Andrea. Um, let's tie the issue that you've been talking about in terms of trauma to the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering if your your thinking on the on uh, trauma and children of color uh, who have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic, by the way, of course. Um, how has this changed your thinking in the last uh, six to nine months? Uh, has your work uh, uh, altered its course at all? Or what's, what's your thinking in terms of the pandemic? You know, honestly, when the pandemic started, I thought, gee, you know, because I had a, a several studies that were put on pause because it required face-to-face -face interaction. And that doesn't, you know, reflect social distancing. And I said, well, nobody's going to want to talk about school suspension or race and identity at this moment. People are thinking about their safety. People are thinking about their health. Nobody's going to want to talk about this. But then I realized when we started, when schools started reintegrating our children back online and realizing even online that um, children are getting suspended from online school, I said, the problem still exists. Yeah. We know that kids are getting kicked out of their Zoom classroom for wearing their pajamas, um, for playing for, with their toy, or having a cat in class, right? Even though we know more and more that having animals um, create a, a space of comfort for helping some people to focus, right? Um, and so I realized that the study that I'm, the work that I do still matters. One, because we know that people of color um, are predominantly affected by COVID, people from low-income backgrounds. But we know that the research is showing that Black and Brown children, specifically African American and Latino children, are the the children most likely to die from COVID-19. Okay, and so not only are they facing a pandemic of racism that's been going on for a long time of COVID-19, they are still being affected um, in their learning because they're still being suspended off of Zoom, right? And um, I empathize for educators because there's so much of their managing um, with children from different um, learning in their different environments and their different homes. But I still think the root of the problem is that there is a punitive mindset when we think about disciplining children, that it's important to shift the paradigm from punishment to support and differentiating learning. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we are almost out of time here, so I'm going to direct one more question to Piria and John, uh, who, uh, by the way, lots of requests to get information about your book. So here you've got, uh, it's time to sell books. Put put a link on, on the chat and everyone can take a look at that. Andrea and Ashley, if there are any other resources that you think folks would benefit from, please put those in the chat as, as well. Um, um, and, and by the way, it, uh, this is the first time I've been wearing clothes like this. I often do Zoom in my pajamas as well. So that's, you know, you should not be punished for that. Um, so the final question for Piria and, and John is, um, how can we turn this one book into a movement where more authors create this type of children's book? Um, I, I think it's appropriate to end on this because uh, all three of you have focused on young people and children who are, of course, our future. How do we, how do we make this even more effective as, a, as an author's movement? Hmm. Do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. I feel like we got to make this one successful. <laughs> and like at least in Thailand, when people see that, well, you can take a risk, I would mm -hmm. say, you know, like if you can take a risk, like by putting like diverse books out there and it can be successful. And then we will have like followers mm -hmm. who want to be like successful and they will be more willing to take risks in like making books like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it basically just takes business investment from publishers like us yeah. to attract uh, the talent and attract the capital so that we can do more books like this. And that also goes back to if this one, the more successful this one is, now the more capital we have to redeploy to invest in others. And that's really the whole point of us being publishers and for us to start this book, to show that it can work and to create a, a sort of formula that others can follow. And then once they have the playbook, then it's in their hands. They can tell whatever stories they want and they can write themselves into history. And that's the whole point. So, yeah, And writing your own story, I think, is really what this panel has, has been about. Uh, I, I want to thank all four of you for an extraordinary conversation this morning, so full of 
data and promise and excitement, action items that we can take, uh, ways that we can control the future, take charge, help um, and, and serve. So this has been a fantastic way to, to start off our conference. I wanna also thank all of you who posed questions, those of you who were in the chat room. We have over a hundred participants on this, uh, this Zoom, which is fantastic. We're so excited about getting off to a great start. Again, thank, uh, thanks to this panel and to all of you. We will be back online at noon, and that's a half an hour from now with our opening plenary. We look forward to um, seeing you then. Thanks again and see you soon. <laughs>